Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Global ALS Clinical Trials Update webinar uh, for ALS Canada. My name is David Taylor. I'm the Vice President of Research for the ALS Society of Canada. We do this every year uh, in June for ALS Awareness Month in Canada, as well as just before the walk to end ALS. Um, you might be wondering why it's me giving this webinar when typically clinical trial updates are done by neurologists. Um, and certainly a lot of those are, are wonderful. We're hoping that when we do these, it also can provide a different perspective um, for some of the items, uh, as well as a, a global perspective on what's happening beyond just the Canadian borders, um, but also from a Canadian perspective on certain, certain uh, aspects of the webinar. <clears throat> so, um, Without the further ado, where do I start? I have questions. Well, I think one of the, the big pieces about a webinar like this is that there will be a lot of people in the audience who, who will already have a, a good base of knowledge on clinical trials, uh, will know what's out there, and will already sort of understand the nuances. But there are also a lot of people who are in that position right now where they're trying to understand what ALS research has to offer them, what can they do, and, and really in a standpoint of trying to understand you know everything that's going on from um, from a standpoint of of not having a background of knowledge on the disease, and so I think one of the key aspects here is that you know you there are options besides Google and social media. This is intended to be one of those options, but really that you do not have to figure out ALS research on your own. Uh, there are all kinds of different areas where you can find this information. Uh, obviously, one of the first pieces I would always push people back to is to speak to their clinician, especially if it's an ALS specialist clinician, because they will have your medical information to help you uh, make the best decisions or come to the best decisions for yourself based on your individual case or your loved one's case. Uh, and then if, I, if, if you can't speak to your clinician or perhaps your clinician is not a research focused uh, clinician, which certainly happens in a lot of cases as well in a lot of areas, um, the idea is to speak to someone who is both knowledgeable and reasonably unbiased. And what do I mean by that? It's somebody who does have a good understanding of the landscape of ALS research, but also um, someone who, who can give you sort of a wider perspective on things. Certainly uh, biases should be crept in when there's an example of say someone says they have a, a child with a fuss mutation, then it doesn't hurt to be able to say, well, maybe you want to check out Ionis and see that they have a, a fuss specific clinical trial going on. Um, but ultimately, I think the key piece is, is to, to get your knowledge from somebody who, or multiple sources of individuals who have a, a good idea of the landscape. For myself, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm just one of those individuals. Uh, I'm now on Twitter. It's uh, um, a learning experience every day, uh, so you can you can certainly follow me on that there if you'd like. Um, my email is also there. And again, the idea for this is really knowledge sharing and facilitation. Um, I've been at this for about 20 years in terms of ALS, uh, so I do have a certain amount of knowledge, um, but it's it's really from a standpoint of, of trying to help you understand what you need for yourself, and it's not about who's giving it, but really um, uh, about you and, and your loved ones uh, who have ALS. And I do hold weekly open chats as well um, to uh, uh, take questions or to, to be able to just chat about anything uh, that you're thinking about with regard to ALS research. So in terms of those clinicians in Canada, um, it comes down to a uh, formalized network of clinicians, uh, which is called CALS, the Canadian ALS Research Network. Um, there are actually uh, 19 of these sites across the country, led or chaired at the moment by Dr. jean viev Matt of the University of Montreal, uh, and then uh, co-chaired by uh, Dr. Kristen Shoesmith of Western University in London, Ontario. Uh, ALS Canada has a, a pretty great collaboration that we work seamlessly with, uh, with CALS, them from the clinical perspective and us uh, from the facilitation um, and uh, advocacy perspective. And so the hope here is that uh, taking all that into account, we can provide some sort of global knowledge on what's happening in ALS so that if you're not from Canada and you're watching this webinar, you'll, you can still gain a, a little bit out of it. But certainly, uh, I think a key piece here is that an hour is certainly not enough to do this. Uh, and, and some of that is great news. The first piece is that there are way too many clinical trials happening in 2021 to effectively go through them all in an hour. Um, and that's a great thing because many years ago, that wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, so we're going to you know, answer some of the questions that I typically get. 
follow on with a, a few um, uh, important things, and then highlight some of the key clinical trials, but we certainly won't be able to get to them all. Uh, so really, in the end, the expectations for this webinar is to consider it sort of a place to start for you to, to, to uh, figure out what questions you do have and to start the discussion in many different places. Uh, another webinar, and this is crazy that I'm actually talking about one of my other webinars, because typically I don't want to talk about what, what I'm doing, but um, a couple of years ago when we did this, we split it into two parts. And the first part of this really allowed for some extra time to go through um, various aspects of clinical trial design. Um, <clears throat> an example of how something goes from idea in the laboratory and all of the timeline it might take to get to uh, people in the clinic. Uh, so some of that might be valuable and complementary to what you'll hear today. Uh, so I, I, I recommend that, but also recommend that there are so many uh, great uh, uh, clinical trial webinars that are out there uh, that you should be following along with. And uh, just like you know, doing a recipe of something that you're going to cook with, you know, look at a bunch of different things, see what's common between them, and really, um, you know, take the best parts of what you can what you can get to to really help you understand your best way forward. Uh, and I will be taking questions at the end. This will probably take about an hour. So I know that we said it was an hour, um, but it's probably going to take about an hour, hour and one minute, something along those lines. Um, and I will stick around for half an hour before I have another meeting because certainly want to be able to take questions. Um, but they will be recorded so people can see it. And, and, and as I said, this is a stepping off point for discussion that can happen offline at any time. Okay, so what is it that we're actually trying to do in ALS clinical trials? What is it that we're trying to do to rescue the disease? Well, as many of you probably are aware of online here, um, ALS is a disease where the living wires called motor neurons, uh, particularly the upper motor neurons, which leaves the brain into the spinal cord, they connect to lower motor neurons in the spinal cord, which then exit the spinal column and go to all of the different muscle cells of the body. These cells degenerate and die, and so your brain no longer has a connection to your muscles to be able to signal them to contract and this leads to a progressive paralysis that spreads throughout the body so the idea here is we want to understand what is the dysfunction that's happening at the molecular level inside these motor neurons that is causing them to degenerate and ultimately die and lead the, to the disconnection at the same point we know a lot over the years that the cells that surround the motor neurons are incredibly important to the disease process these are cells called glial cells as well as other cells like t cells that can leave the uh, bloodstream and and actually have an influence on motor neuron health in this in the central nervous system uh, and so one other aspect of clinical trials is to really focus on uh, how can we help a more nurturing environment and provide a, a, a happier environment for the motor neurons to survive longer and healthier within. And this is a slide that I've shown many times if you've ever seen me present. Uh, I do like it because it really does highlight um, one of the reasons why ALS in uh, clinical trials or experimental therapeutics on ALS are quite difficult. Um, and that is because most of the treatable diseases we have today have been heavily funded and are far simpler. Uh, and probably one of the best analogies for why ALS is so difficult is that when you look at, um, or at least comparators, it, when you look at uh, diseases of other neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's that may have had more funding, more awareness, are still struggling to be able to find really effective therapies. And that's because it's difficult to understand the central nervous system. It's very complex. Neurons are very complex cells. Um, and, uh, and, and so working with less money and being able to do that is very difficult. But I think the positive piece here and being somebody that, you know, really started in ALS back in the very, very early 2000s, is the ability to see the perspective of where we've come from. And, and while I can only imagine how unbelievably difficult it is to, to be diagnosed with ALS in 2021 and to say, how could we possibly not have great treatment regimens for, for people in this day and age? Um, it has come a long way in terms of our understanding this complex disease. And I think, you know, we are getting to a place where we'll get to more targeted therapies that are more ALS specific type treatments in the years to come. Um, and um, a little later in the webinar, we're going to focus on some of that uh, in a little more detail. But I think the piece that really validates what, what's been said by a lot of us over the past five or six years is, is that we have come a long way is when you start to look at the number of companies or industry that are invested in clinical development in ALS. And actually, I asked a venture capitalist about five or 10 years ago, no, not 10 years ago, five years ago, um, 
you know, why don't we have more? What can we do to facilitate more investment in ALS clinical trials? And the answer was simply that you need to understand the disease better. You need to have a better indication that those who are investing in it have a chance at getting return on investment by um, ultimately funding clinical trials that have a high success potential. Uh, and so now when you see this many companies, and this is only a subset of the companies that are invested in clinical trials in ALS, you can you can tell that these are business people and, and investors that believe there's an actual potential in our understanding of the disease to lead to the, to the possibility of success of any one of these particular therapies. And before I get into any more details, one of the things I really wanted to focus on is uh, uh, some trusted online resources. Um, so, you know, beyond this clinical trials webinar and other ones, uh, you can always check clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, this is a, a very detailed uh, sort of gold standard website for clinical trials that are happening around the world. It won't capture everything. There are certainly databases like the EU Clinical Trials Register, uh, Australian Register, Asian Registries, uh, certainly China has one that won't always be listed on clinicaltrials.gov. But we are very fortunate in the field to have uh, a relatively new uh, um, uh, mechanism that was uh, supported by IMALS and, uh, you know, Know, really driven by uh, some great individuals, Callie Orselak, Nadia Sethi, and uh, Sandy Morris, to, to put together a team that really collated a lot of these into something called the ALS Signal Database. And it's a, it's a very user-friendly interface that then links out, if you do want a, more information, to things like clinicaltrials.gov to be able to give you uh, uh, the specifics on a, sp on, on a particular clinical trial. Uh, so a really great uh, place to start uh, through the ALS Signal uh, uh, Database. <clears throat> So moving forward to the basics, I think one of the things I want to preface here is that, you know, I, I don't say any of these things lightly in the sense that I am very aware and, and empathize that clinical trials are a source of hope for people living with ALS and for their loved ones. And, and I would be no different if I had ALS um, that, that, you know, you would want to participate for experimental therapeutic access to potentially help your disease. Um, so none of this is said in a way that is um, meant to be um, non-compassionate to that. Um, and and so I think from a from a, a sense of, of where science is at with it. I think it's also important to note that clinical trials are indeed medical experiments. This is taking something that presumably has some decent evidence backing up why you would test a particular therapeutic and then saying we have to be able to prove whether or not it actually works in humans. Is it safe? Is it tolerable? Does it actually work? And one of the key things that I think has to be noted for people who, who are fairly new to this is that if something is in clinical trial, that means we do not have a pro enough proof that something works. And you may read a lot of media articles, you may lead, read a lot of things that will say this slowed down disease by 70% or uh, this had an effect on the disease in this way. But unless those particular companies or those particular that particular drug is applied for approval by someone like FDA Health Canada or, or the European Medicines Agency, it means they don't have enough proof to actually be able to claim that they know it works at this point. So that's important to know because sometimes it can be hard to interpret things where it says breakthrough and where it says really promising results. And it means that we don't, as scientists or as, as clinicians, have uh, enough information just yet. Uh, and really the idea for clinical trials is to get an answer about safety, tolerability, and efficacy. Um, and uh, often tolerability is one that's not thought about. A great example of that uh, we'll talk about after with cytokinetics, who had something that was reasonably safe, may have had some efficacy, but the problem with when they got to a phase three clinical trial was the drug tirsemtiv was leading to uh, dizziness and nausea to a point that it wasn't very tolerable to take. Um, and so all three of those things are really important to be able to assess to get it to the point of a market, um, or at least being prescribed for people. And ultimately, the gold standard for this is really still a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Um, you know, we can talk about more details of this offline, but the idea behind that is you need to be able to assess the progression of some people who are potentially on the drug but not, or on the therapy, versus those that are over a period of time that allows us to see whether it's actually working. And unfortunately, 
this is where it seems like it's a, a little cold, but it's true that participation is largely altruistic to help medicine and science. And where this comes into play is, you know, sometimes people will be involved in trials and they'll feel like something is working for them. And it may be an early stage trial that's only for a few months and then the trial will end. And, and that is unfortunate in the way that things work. And we need to do certainly more um, uh, work in the field to be able to figure out how we can balance that with giving access to people in a wider realm and, and for longer periods of time. And nowadays, open label extensions where everybody who gave up their time and participated in the trial, whether they were on placebo or active, would get the active treatment for a period of time after the end of the trial. It's, it's become really the norm and we need to advance on that as well. In terms of uh, where therapy is is actually tested, that is up to the owners of the therapy. So in the case of, of, of pharmaceutical companies, they ultimately make that decision. And I say this because often we'll have in Canada someone who will say, well, why didn't we get this trial here? Nobody cared, nobody advocated for us. And, and, and sometimes it's not the case. There's a lot of advocacy done, but ultimately a, a company needs to decide where they feel is best to run their clinical trial. And then ultimately the same thing when they apply for, for, for their data for approval, it is something they own and, and they make those decisions moving forward. Now, a very complicated question in ALS is how do we know if something works? And, uh, you know, that comes down to things we call outcome measures and also biomarkers, which can be outcome measures. Um, this comes back to the hour is not enough because I think there are so many things we could do a uh, full one hour on and certainly outcome measures and biomarkers is one of the ones that we could have a very long, uh, a more detailed uh, set of uh, explanations on where we're at with this. But most clinical trials will have a primary outcome measure, which it will be judged by this is what they're trying to prove in the clinical trial and a number of secondary measures that can help to provide more data or support for that primary measure. The most common primary measure used in ALS is something called the ALS Functional Rating Scale Revised. This is a measure, a 48-point scale uh, that over a period of time will show dysfunction in a person as they, they, uh, the disease progresses. It is not a perfectly linear scale. We know there is a lot of discussion that needs to happen around this, but over a period of time, it will... Uh, uh, will be something that can be measured against uh, a, an active drug that sees to whether or not it could it could preserve ALS FRS R function. Um, in terms of lengths of trials, uh, it has been pre a precedent now with uh, with Radicava that the US FDA will be able to accept at some point six months or at least look at six months of data. Um, and Europe tends to to uh, uh, look more at longer trials uh, that are at least 12 months in, in, in duration and that have some level of survival. Um, but there are many outcome measures that are still being validated and um, uh, ultimately that we need to be able to learn more about them. One of the things that's really key moving forward, and again, could be as a webinar all unto itself, is biomarkers. And this is more objective ways to be able to measure if a treatment works, as well as whether the treatment is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And we need to find better measures to be able to say, ultimately, is our motor neurons being preserved? Is the disease being helped without having to resort to some subjective level of, of, of understanding? Uh, and neurofilaments is one that we're looking at to say, can this be a measure of, 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 of motor neuron uh, um, uh, breakdown that ultimately might be preserved. Um, but ultimately, if we, if we find better ones of these, it might speed up clinical trials. It will also provide more objective data as to whether something is working. The other key piece that's important with biomarkers is to make sure that trials of an experimental therapeutic, that if it's dr driven towards a particular mechanism to try to help motor neuron survival, we want to be able to see some sort of objective measure that says it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. The reason for that is if the trial fails, for example, and it, we weren't able to prove that it was doing what it was doing, we no longer know in science whether or not it was the mechanism that was the problem or the therapy itself. And so it's really important for us to show that the target is being hit so that we can better understand whether or not if it works or it doesn't work, whether or not that system is important. So another question that comes up a lot is why do clinical trials take so long? Uh, the other webinar that I gave a couple of years ago will we'll delineate this in, a, in much more detail, um, but just to sort of not belabor it, but to get into it uh, just a little bit. Um, you know, first of all, there's the setup of trials. This can take a long time because you need to get all of the sites involved. You need to get each one of those sites through an ethics approval to be able to run the trial at their particular site. There's all kinds of education about what will happen in that trial, how will they run it. Um, and then we get into the point where ultimately, uh, and I should say, 
that we'll talk briefly about platform trials, which is really designed to sort of squeeze up that setup of the trial into uh, uh, something that's a more permanent mechanism to run uh, um, uh, trial or, or, or experimental therapeutics on as a platform. Uh, but the thing that we really can't shrink very well at the moment is is having to measure disease progression in people who are on the drug. We need to be or the therapy. We need to be able to see over a period of time versus individuals who are progressing whether or not that particular therapy is having an effect. And then after that, obviously, you need to to, to take into account that people need to be recruited to the trial. A great way of looking at this is if you have a six-month clinical trial and the first person is recruited on January 1st, 2021, the last person is recruited on January 1st, 2022, this is going to be a one and a half year trial of the studying of those individuals because that last person in still needs to have be measured over the course of six months. And so we can recruit quicker, we can squeeze that timeline as well. And then finally, data collection validation analysis is important. So ultimately, what we can do in the field is try to shrink these time points around the ultimate point that we can't really change at the moment, which is actually having to measure the progression of the disease in individuals to see whether or not the therapy is working. Now, this is where biomarkers also come into play because we can find more um, uh, very strong measures of whether or not something is working in an objective objective way, we may be able to do things much quicker because if something is working very clearly on an objective measure after a few months, maybe this would be enough to, to support uh, evidence for the, the, the particular therapeutic working. And it's why so much effort is being put into biomarker research these days. Another question is why is trial inclusion criteria so narrow? Um, you know, uh, I will I will say at the outset that a lot is being worked on to find better ways to make more inclusive clinical trials. Um, I think the biggest reason is that what you have in most cases a pharmaceutical company or an in, uh, a, a particular um, a sponsor for a clinical trial that is putting a lot of investment in and wants to get an answer at the end. And as we all really know, ALS is different from person to person, very different. And if you don't have some sort of indication or balance on who's being put into the clinical trial, trial, the result can end up that you don't actually get an interpretable answer. And then what you've done is waste even more time for everyone by not getting uh, doing the trial as, as well as possible to understand if it has some effect. The positive piece out of this is that given the nature of ALS, should something work in a subpopulation of people with the disease, there's a high hope at this time that we'll be able to get some sort of approval if something is really robustly working for the wider group of people with the disease. Radicava being an example of something in the United States and Canada, where it was approved for everyone, even though they had a smaller trial criteria. Um, and so ultimately that's the reason, but again, as I said, there's a lot of work being put together to say, how can we better uh, find ways that are amenable to ALS being a disease of, of, of a need for urgency to find uh, uh, mechanisms for more inclusivity in trials without de uh, diminishing the ability to get answers quickly that are uh, interpretable. Okay, so now moving ahead to recently completed phase three clinical trials, we'll just highlight a few of the things here um, for those who um, um may or may not know in the past year we have had a couple of prominent phase three clinical trials that have finished. Two of them that are are pretty clearly not working uh, were Levosimendin by Orium Pharma um, and Aramoclamol by Orf Orfazyme. Levosimendin was fo focused on um, stimulating the muscle in response to uh, uh, neuronal signals. And aramoclamol is a drug that was designed to try to help uh, protein folding within cells, which we know is something that's abnormal in, in neurodegenerative diseases like ALS. Both of them have pretty clear results, um, but we are still hopeful to get uh, publications as well as from Orphazyme some, some biomarker data, which may help us to uh, further our ability to run clinical trials and to, to get a better understanding of the disease. Uh, but I think for now, it's probably time that we can move on from these two, uh, unfortunately, obviously. In terms of brainstorms neuron, uh, where are we at at the moment? Well, before I get into that piece, uh, there is a question that I frequently get um, over the course of the years, uh, both through the phase two and phase three, which is around uh, the responder uh, level of a 1.25 point per month improvement um, in the ALS FRSR slope. Uh, a very simple way of looking at this is that um, if someone was uh, progressing on ALS FRSR at two points per month, uh, this would be sort of a curve in terms of the loss of function that would happen in a very rudimentary sense. And it means that a responder would meet at least the criteria of slowing the progression of the disease by this much, 
uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean in all cases that it's a rebound or an improvement. So sometimes the word improvement can confuse um, in, in the sense of, uh, of, of how it's worded, but ultimately it's, it's essentially designed to show that there's a, a slowing of progression of the disease. And, and that in, unto itself is certainly prominent when that can be reached. In terms of what we know at this point, uh, we know that 95 people on the phase three clinical trial were receiving uh, the Neurone uh, uh, active treatment. 33 of those people showed uh, that they were responders, so essentially stopped or slowed progression of the disease over seven months. 94% or sorry, 94 people on the trial received an injection of cell medium, so no cells, no neuron uh, treatment, and 26 of those individuals stopped or slowed progression over seven months. In terms of the pre-specified subgroup, uh, um, which are people who had less dysfunction at the time of, of treatment, 26 of those individuals received neuron uh, with the stem cells. Nine of those people uh, ended up being uh, classified as responders and 32 people um, <clears throat> who were on uh, the placebo, five of those uh, also were uh, deemed responders. Uh, so at this point, in terms of statistical significance or uh, from what uh, the wide group of clinicians and researchers, with the data that we have at the moment, there isn't a lot that the majority of clinicians are able to say they support any, any benefit from their own. Now, again, what I have highlighted here is that there are many powerful stories uh, of benefit from the participants that still needs to be rectified. Perhaps I'm blinding and seeing that those who are most vocal about how they've they've received benefit from this all end up on the active component uh, of the trial. Perhaps the preservation of neural filaments is, is clear in those individuals who responders on their own versus those who were on uh, placebo. Uh, you know, we don't have that data yet. And certainly there are some clinicians who are on the trial who do support what's there. So I think ultimately what it, what it comes down to is it's, it's, it's a situation that re remains in Brainstorm's hands at the moment. And we do know they submitted for a peer reviewed publication. Hopefully when we get those, those uh, that uh, uh, published and, and those results out, we'll learn a bit more. Um, maybe Brainstorm will, will consider applying to uh, uh, FDA or other regulatory bodies around the world. Uh, we don't know yet, uh, and so ultimately, I think it remains in their hands what will move forward, but certainly, if it works, we want to make sure it gets to people. Um, but as I said, for the wider clinical community, I think what, what the data that has been presented to date has not been able to show any, any efficacy to the majority of them. So uh, it remains to be seen what will happen, uh, but we're certainly hopeful if it does work that it does get to people. Ongoing clinical trials, I obviously can't focus on these in huge detail, so I'm just going to focus on a, a, a few key ones that are really closest to answers uh, and also ones that I think are more prominent in terms of the, the mechanisms that are being focused on. Uh, I won't belabor this one because this is going to be something you'll hear about a lot over the next several years, which is Amelix's AMX35. Um, this is a, a, a combination drug of something called sodium phenylbutyrate and TUDCA. I uh, won't get into the details of those other than to say that on a phase two clinical trial that was double-blind, placebo-controlled, uh, they were able to show that there was significant, statistically significant slowing of disease progression by about 25%, and that when they ran an open-label extension, those who were on uh, uh, the therapy over the, the full duration of the experimental and open-label phase had about a 6.5-month extension of survival versus those who started out on placebo, which is, uh, um, you know, something that we have not seen a lot in ALS. As a result, um, there, you know, is um, uh, some regulatory bodies that have been willing to accept an application, as you may have seen yesterday in the news, that Amelix has applied to Health Canada for potential approval of AMX35. Um, it, of note for Canadians here, uh, what will happen next is if Health Canada accepts the application uh, and if they grant it something called priority review, which we don't know yet if that will happen, it will be six months uh, until the time of dis the, the decision will be released. Uh, somewhat simultaneously and afterwards, there will be post-Health Canada mechanisms to determine how it can be accessed uh, effectively, certainly through our provincial uh, health plans eventually. Uh, and you can check out all of ALS Canada's advocacy work to get more information on those mechanisms and how we're trying to advocate to shrink those as quickly as possible alongside other organizations for sure. Um, and uh, we know that Amelix has announced that they are exploring options alongside the CALS network to and Health Canada to try to find mechanisms for early access and we can expect that if there is something in there that we will we will hear about it in the days ahead.
As far as uh, the rest of the world, what you will see is a phase three clinical trial to really try to confirm the results of the Centaur phase two th clinical trial called Phoenix. It'll be a large one at 600 patients. Sorry, I should say participants. My apologies for putting patients there, everyone. Uh, that should say participants. Uh, this will be uh, a novel first time of a, a collaboration between TriCals, the European network, the largest European network, and Niels, the largest uh, uh, American network uh, for ALS clinical trials. Um, and will be a 48-week assessment that will look at both function and survival, as well as some experimental outcome measures, which, as I've said earlier, is really key that these kinds of trials bring forward experimental outcome measures and non-experimental ones to learn more about how we can run clinical trials better moving forward. And one of the ones they're actually going to have is going to be a remote measure, which, as we can imagine, both for people with ALS and the, the, the specifics of the disease, as well as in current day with the, the, the pandemic, um, learning more about how we can do remote uh, um, evaluation of ALS and clinical trials is going to be really important moving forward. Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma um, is, uh, it's it's Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America are running a lot of the clinical trials. As you will know, they are uh, the owners of uh, Adaravone, which is known as Radicava, where it's approved in uh, United States and, and Canada, also Radicut in Asia, both Japan and South Korea have it approved. Um, this is an IV formulation that is uh, given two weeks on, two weeks off, based on the original uh, use of it in stroke therapy in Japan. Uh, and what they've really been pushing on the last several years is to try to find a, a, an easier regimen for people with ALS, including an, a particularly an oral suspension. Um, and so to work hard on that, they had to do a, a number of things to get to where they are. First, they had to measure what happens in the body with the dose of the oral suspension. Does it, in fact, uh, through both gastrostomy uh, uh, dosing and through oral dosing, does it actually get to where it needs to do in the, the proper concentrations similar to the IV form? And then what they need to do is to see long-term safety of oral adaravone. And that trial is no longer recruiting, but it is on an open label phase where they're assessing the safety of the uh, oral adaravone over a long period of time to make sure on the two weeks on, two weeks off regimen um, that it's actually safe to take. And now what you have that's recruiting in a lot of different places is a trial that a lot of people have been waiting for, which is to say, is the oral adarvone when taken daily uh, actually better than having it on the standard regimen, which is the two weeks on and two weeks off? Um, and so that will help to tell people what a lot of people had suggested as to whether or not that original regimen was ultimately the optimal way to, to, to be taking radicava or, or oral adarvone. A Darwin in general. Um, also at the same time, as we said, it's critical that we understand what treatments are actually doing in the body and learning more about how we can get better biomarkers. And so the Refine ALS trial is taking individuals who uh, uh, want to participate in a trial who are who are prescribed IV form radicava right now um, and collecting blood and urine to be able to see, is it actually working as an antioxidant as is as suggested? Is it actually preserving uh, uh, neurofilament levels and other experimental uh, uh, biomarkers to be able to better understand how it might be having an effect in people with ALS? In terms of another phase three clinical trial that's quite large is uh, Alexion. Uh, they have a drug called uh, Revulizumab or Ultimiris, which is approved for other condition. another condition. Um, it is a uh, inhibitor of something called the complement factor C5. And um, so we won't get into all of this, but essentially the complement uh, pathway is an immune inflammatory pathway that is, is ultimately part of our immune system that triggers ultimate uh, sort of cell death pathways. I think that's the easiest way to look at it, that triggering the complement pathway is a cascade of factors that ultimately leads to various things that can that can ultimately lead to cell death. And so what Alexion's doing is, is, in, is in using this drug to inhibit one of the key mechanisms or key mediators in the complement pathway in hopes that they can reduce some of that cell, those cell death mechanisms from being activated. And so I will say that, you know, complement cascade is not something that has a ton of preclinical evidence in ALS. However, uh, there's likely some evidence out there enough to support the fact that there are a, a number of complement cascade targeting uh, experimental therapeutics that are being tested in clinical trial right now. Uh, many of you will know on the Healy platform trial, there's the leucoplan by UCB, which is also a C5 inhibitor. 
uh, Apelis has picked Cetacle Plan, which is a, uh, a phase two uh, clinical trial of a C3 inhibitor. So now you can see where the C3 is, another key point in the complement cascade. And an Exxon actually has one that's further upstream called the C1Q inhibitor, um, which is interesting as well because um, the work of the late Ben Barris has actually shown that uh, C1Q might be an important mediator towards activating or um, some of those glial cells I talked about before called astrocytes, something that we haven't necessarily targeted very well in ALS and, and may have a significant impact if we can effectively target those astrocytes. So that's an interesting one that does have some basis of, uh, of good clinical uh, preclinical data coming to it and, uh, and, and should be interesting to see how it moves forward. Medici Nova is another company that has a phase two, three uh, clinical trial coming forward. Uh, it was originally uh, uh, sort of uh, believed to be something that affected our immune and inflammatory responses and, 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 and reduced some of those in the neighboring cells around the motor neurons. Uh, a, a recent biomarker trial that finished a couple years ago showed that that may or may not be the case. It's a little bit difficult to assess. There's been some preclinical data that's shown it may actually stimulate a, an important uh, mechanism called a TOF which can recycle bad proteins. Um, but ultimately, I think at this point, what we're going to see is that after the 12-month trial that they're running right now, or at least 12 months of measurement, it will be longer than 12 months overall, as I stated before, uh, we'll get an idea as to whether Ibotalast has some effect on people living with ALS. Uh, and finally, I know there are a couple other phase threes that are out there, but we're going to just focus on this last one, which is cytokinetics. They have run a clinical program of a, a drug called Tiracemptive, which showed some pretty interesting results uh, on functional decline and, and uh, uh, respiratory measures in a phase two of, of, of that drug called Tiracemptive, which I, I mentioned earlier, had tolerability issues and dropout issues in the phase three. Um, now the more advanced compound Reldeceptive, which is doing the same uh, thing, but without those side effects. Is, is finally reached a phase three clinical trial um, where it's really designed to increase the muscle's responsiveness to uh, neuronal signals with the idea that as the neurons degenerate, even though you're not stopping what's happening in those neurons, can you provide function for a longer period of time? And there are some interim analysis planned. It seems to be a, a very exciting trial moving forward to be able to really assess if this is a mechanism that's going to be uh, amenable to, uh, to preserving function for a longer period of time in people with the disease. Okay, so in, in terms of important trials to know, there are so many of them, and I'm not going to be able to focus on all of them today. Um, I, I'm just going to focus on a few because I think that, well, and I'll explain afterwards, um, why I think it's important to look at things that are more targeted towards ALS-specific therapies, and, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, <clears throat> and so where we're seeing now is we're seeing the first sort of set of gene-targeted therapies in recent years. Um, and in order to understand what we mean by this, I hate to bring people back to basic biology, uh, but hopefully it's helpful. <clears throat> in all of our cells, including our motor neurons, you have this sort of command center, this circular piece here called the nucleus, and inside the nucleus is our DNA. And the DNA encodes everything we need to live at the cellular level. So it's all the, encode, the coded genes that we have. Now, a small section of the DNA, small sections of them are genes that encode a specific movable form of that coding called RNA, which ultimately translates into a protein. And so I've shown you the example here is that the SOD1 gene will have the exact coding needed to produce an SOD1 protein, which will have a specific function for our cells to survive in a healthy way. Now, we know that if you have a mutation in one of these genes, it's a small change in the code that ultimately translates all the way through to a change in the protein and now the protein may have no problems at all but in the case of ALS this protein may have an extra toxic function beyond its normal function or it may cause it to lose its normal function in ways that could be toxic to the motor neuron health. And this is ultimately how we work in the laboratory to make models of the disease. We would actually give these mutations to a mouse, a fish, a worm, a rat, some flies, and they will ultimately get motor neuron degeneration by producing those mutant proteins. And we can study over time before the disease symptoms start, after and during, to be able to better understand what is the actual mechanisms that are happening so we can target it with treatment. <clears throat> 
And so one of the things you might hear a lot about, and I'll just focus on this for a second at a high level, um, proteins can actually be targeted very effectively through antibodies. Now, antibodies are part of our natural immune system, and we can use these as therapies as well. And I'm only mentioning this because so many of the therapies are antibodies these days. They will be specific to a certain protein and will help us to either uh, uh, inoculate or like, sorry, sorry, not inoculate, to um, uh, um, uh, stop any kind of bad function of the protein or to actually help get rid of the bad protein. Um, so that's where antibodies come in. But what we're looking at in terms of gene targeted therapies are really focused on this mechanism upstream of the protein production. And so there are a few of them uh, that are in uh, clinical development for ALS. The first one that many of you will have heard of are called antisense oligonucleotides. Uh, this is a, a sort of a small piece of that code that binds to that RNA or the movable form of the DNA code um, and can actually either stop the protein from being synthesized completely, or if we do them in a smart way, you might be able to alter the protein a little bit in a potentially therapeutic way, or even increase the levels of a protein by doing this in a really smart fashion. And we've now seen with something like Spinraza for spinal muscular atrophy that ASOs are a, a viable pathway through to a, a prescribable therapy. Uh, so that's what makes it very exciting for ALS as well. Adeno-associated virus is something that, again, has been shown to be a proven thing for uh, SMA with uh, uh, Zolgensma. Uh, this is an idea where you can actually have an effect in a more permanent sense with a single dose uh, by using viral technology. So essentially, I shouldn't say technology, but even viruses themselves, the whole concept of a virus is it can infect a cell and it can take over the cell's ability to produce what it wants in a way that's toxic and causes the cell to burst open. Well, in using technology, we can evolve that to use the, the good parts about viruses and then have them cause the cell to make what we want them to make in a therapeutic sense. The one thing or one of the few things that's sort of stopping this or slowing this down from an adult sense is that our immune systems are different from young children where this is being used already in a clinical sense. Um, and so a lot of that is evolving, but certainly there are people looking at AAV vectors as a, a potentially great mechanism for targeting ALS uh, proteins moving forward. And finally, you've probably also heard of things like CRISPR-Cas9 and the technology that's developed in terms of gene editing where you can directly alter uh, uh, the genetics of a living organism. And one of the ones that's also coming forward by a, a company called Sangamo in uh, uh, collaboration with Pfizer is to look at something called zinc finger nucleases uh, that can do this sort of gene editing as well. I won't get into the details of that. Um, Biogen is really the leader in the clinical space right now for gene targeted therapies, or at least the furthest along in the process, most significantly. And obviously we could talk a lot about this one. Many of you will know Tofersen is a uh, antisense and oligonucleotide targeted to the first genet known genetic cause of ALS, which leads to mutations in SOD1. Um, now, one of the things we know about SOD1, very fortunate in this case, was that it causes, that mutation causes the protein to have a toxic gain of function. So the ASO is designed to try to reduce the levels of the SOD1 and what we're seeing anecdotally around the world is that individuals who have been on this therapy for now a number of years in open label extension since the very first phase one uh, portion of the trial have done very well in a general sense. Um, and uh, we've seen some, some amazing things that we hope will ultimately work in, um, in when we get the data out later this year um, from the uh, Valor trial. Now, this is their, you know, the, the results of this so far in terms of what we, we've seen or what has been seen has led to the confidence for something that I, I hesitate to use the word groundbreaking uh, often, but I do think this is a groundbreaking cl clinical trial for ALS in, in the ATLAS clinical trial that will be coming forward soon. And the idea here is that people who have SOD1 uh, mutations who are known can have monthly measuring of a blood biomarker, in this case, a neurofilament, that when you have a spike in that level, it allows them to be randomized into either the placebo or, or tofersen with the idea now of potentially slowing down upstream of ever getting clinical symptoms or someday the idea of preventing ALS. Now, obviously when somebody starts having actual clinical symptoms, 
everybody would be then put onto Tofersen, especially if it turns out that Valor works and 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 Tofersen is approved, then you can imagine that anybody diagnosed with ALS with an SOD1 mutation would have it as a normal uh, function of of uh, of their treatment. So anyone at that point would would be switched over to make sure that this is all run as as, as well as possible. But very very exciting and hopefully something we can get to eventually with stronger uh, more targeted treatments in the wider sense. Another really exciting advancement will come out soon, which is the very first inkling of what's happening with C9R72 in humans. Uh, what I mean by that is we've studied C9R72 mechanisms very strongly in the lab over the past seven or eight years um, and have come to the conclusion that it may be both a gain of function through se several mechanisms of the C9R72 protein, or at least what's produced from the gene, and also a loss of potential function of C9R72 protein. And so this ASO is really designed to tackle that gain of function mechanism. And while it's very small and really aimed at safety, hopefully it might give some inkling as to whether or not targeting the gain of function is important. Although it is not powered for that, so we will see moving forward. But I guess what's very important for that is that there are a number of C9 or 72 targeted trials that are in the stages of reaching clinical development very soon. And a very exciting one, and this is where it gets to the point of thinking about those who don't have a known genetic mutation, but actually might be uh, available for something that's an ALS-focused trial. The ATAXIN2 ASO clinical trial is currently recruiting in phase one. Um, this is based around a couple of things. So first of all, we know that if you have a mutation that causes an extension of like a huge chunk of extra DNA, similar to what's happening in C9 or 72. So now you're not just having one piece of DNA that's changed, but you have this kind of abnormal chunk of DNA that's put in there. With ataxin 2, when you have this large, large chunk, it causes a different disease. But if you have a smaller extension than what you normally have, this may be a high risk for ALS. Now, the same gentleman who sort of first found that out, Dr. Aaron Gittler, also found out that in a mouse model uh, that Comfort that is more likely representative of a wider case of people with ALS, um, uh, which is a TDP43 mutation, they showed that when you knock down ataxin 2 or reduce the levels of it, that it actually can have a significant impact on these mice, which then again leads to this clinical trial where knocking down uh, or reducing the levels of ataxin 2 can actually be tried in people who don't have any kind of extension of the ataxin 2 gene or any kind of mutation, uh, which makes it exciting because you're pulling something that's ALS specific out of the lab and putting it into the clinic in a very targeted way. And I can't go into any of these in detail, sadly, but there are a lot of things in the pipeline. More will come that will be focused using these gene-targeted therapies. Um, uh, one even that is, uh, is, is quite novel is uh, looking at expressing something called a hepatocyte growth factor using uh, plasmid DNA, which is what we would use typically for cells in a laboratory. And, and, and now, uh, apparently through this company, Helix Smith has been advanced in a way that might be able to cause uh, expression in a living organism or in humans in this case. Um, so again, showing that the technology is continually advancing and we're just dipping our toes into the water of these kind of more targeted ALS specific therapies, which is really exciting. You know, I'm 45 minutes into this uh, this talk and we're just on platform trials. I won't belabor this point because I think most people know there's a lot of great information about platform trials out there. It's important to note though, how I did mention before, that one of the biggest things we can fix in ALS trial design is the whole idea of, of the time in between the measuring of people on an experimental therapeutic. How can we shrink those time points? And stealing directly from Merit Sokovic and, and Sabrina Paganoni from the Healy platform, uh, a great analogy here is building a whole stadium to play one game and then demolishing the stadium. It just doesn't make sense. So building things, as a Blue Jays fan, this is a tough one to put, but it's it's really true. Building things to last that you can play multiple games in is really a great trial design for ALS moving forward. Uh, and there are a number of these around the world. Two of them are actively going. Uh, one is starting up soon. So the MND Smart trial in in uh, in Scotland in the UK uh, was recruiting right now with two treatment regimens. Uh, the Magnet study is forthcoming through TriCals, and obviously many of you will know the Healy uh, platform trial, which is really in the end, as you can see with all of these, designed to say that you can test multiple regimens side by side, reducing the amount of placebo that a person might be randomized to, so a better chance you're on some sort of active component, uh, and really a great trial 
trial design to be able to get quick answers on whether or not something either needs more evidence or we can set it as or if it's enough evidence from the trial itself or whether we can set it aside and probably move on to something else uh, which is something obviously with the urgency of ALS we absolutely need. So looking at what's in the platform trials, uh, there are obviously very well delineated ones that are active in the Healy trial, two in the MND SMART trial. It isn't fully clear exactly which ones will in Magnet, although one of the ones that has been discussed is really cool. It's about genetic responders to a, a previously tested therapy. I uh, would love to talk about that in more detail, but sometime offline maybe. Um, but I think one of the key aspects here uh, of note is that um, these are still clinical trials for a reason, which is that we do not know if they work. So while these are all chosen by a group of really strong academic leaders in the field um, to be run, it doesn't mean that they are more promising than standalone trials that are out there. It's that the mechanism is wonderful for ALS. And, and I say that because one of the questions I frequently get is why doesn't Canada participate in a platform trial? And I'm sure this is the same for other countries as well. Um, it's important to note that there are a lot of trials out there for promising therapeutics that are not going through a platform mechanism at this time, and there's only 12% of countries in the world that are actually ready to be able to run clinical trials. And again, the therapies that are within these are not necessarily better or worse. They are tested because we don't know if they will actually work. And so. Uh, it was a conscious decision by the clinical uh, uh, leaders in Canada to, to make a decision based on the amount of, of bandwidth it would take from the most important or the most uh, uh, trial uh, experience sites in Canada to run a particular trial, uh, a platform trial, and, and meetings were had. Um, versus being able to have a breadth of trials and to be nimble enough to bring in new ones. Uh, so it was decided that this was the best way to go as of 2021. But this is not something to be negative about. This is actually positive because I think what I've tried to say on Twitter as well is that this is something that's complementary in that we all need to get to therapies as quickly as possible and that while the platform trial is going to run through a lot of them, that's fantastic. These other ones are also complementary and need to have something testing them. And so if something works through a platform trial, that's fantastic. We champion them and vice versa if something works through standalone trials. And standalone trials are run at most of the sites as well, um, where there are also platform trials. And there are pros and cons to everything. So obviously, a better treatment to placebo ratio on a platform trial. At the same time, because you're randomized to all of the different therapies, if there's something you're particularly interested in, you actually have a better chance of being on the active component in a standalone trial than the small chance that you get randomized to the active arm of the one that you want amongst five or six other ones. So really, in the end, it's, it's an, as of 2021, things may change. Uh, Canada is not intending to be part of a platform trial, but that is not to say that there isn't a lot of activity around bringing trials to Canada. And this comes from a, a recent webinar uh, by Dr. Angela Genge, which highlights in Canada the number of ongoing or very soon to come clinical trials to Canadian sites. And we need to continue to work to get those uh, across the country even more than they already are. Uh, but, but again, showing that there's no lack of effort to, to bring a lot of promising clinical trials to Canadian, uh, Canadian sites. Uh, very briefly, T regulatory cell therapy. I won't belabor this one as well. This is something that has uh, I'm highlighting only because it has a, a pretty solid amount of rep, uh, replicated preclinical evidence and a number of strategies looking to focus on it. Um, a lot of the work comes from Dr. Stan Appel, which shows that T regulatory cells um, can actually uh, slow down toxic immune and inflammatory responses that can be harmful to motor neurons, and that it's shown that those individuals with faster progressing ALS have a very, very low number of these T regular T uh, of functional T regulatory cells, um, and that people in general with ALS have less functional T regulatory cells. So he's working with Koya Therapeutics to develop uh, something where that which has shown some initial promise where you uh, transplant back T regulatory cells, uh, you take them out, you turn them into T regulatory cells, you put them back into the person who, who um, who uh, uh, donated them originally and hope that it can have an effect on slowing progression of the disease. Um, and so we don't know if this will work yet. We haven't had robust enough data from double-blind placebo-controlled trials from any of these, uh, but things like the MiroCal study is actually trying a low dose of the, the stimulant to cause perhaps 
uh, uh, repro or, or, or internal production of T regulatory cells without the transplant. And a number of others are also focused on T regulatory cells as one of the major mechanisms in, in their potential therapeutic uh, um, uh, mechanisms for, for the disease. All this to say, and there's also a, a, a trial in China looking at transplanting as well, T-regulatory cells. All of this to say that in the next couple of years, we really should get some good indication as to whether this is a great strategy for ALS. Um, and again, one that's based on some, some, some strong evidence from uh, preclinical laboratory data. And gosh, I wish I could talk about these in much more detail. Uh, I know you probably are glad I, I'm not, but I think in, in so many of these places, there are things that could potentially be the next therapy for ALS. A lot of these are early, they're open label. So just, I put both cautious optimism and proceed with caution because a lot of these will come out to results. They may be open label, they may, which means that there's no placebo control, uh, no blinding, um, they, they may be very small and they may interpret results in a way publicly that makes us believe that they are working. And we still have to be cautious to, to get to those kinds of trials that really provide evidence. Uh, and gosh, even on the third one, I couldn't even fit them all in in the same format, so I just shoved them all in there. But that's exciting because now there are just so many potential options that could come through clinical trial and ultimately be something uh, that would eventually work for ALS around the world. So a few more key thoughts and questions. I'll go through these quite quickly, um, but I'll, I'll highlight again, um, you know, with the, the large number of clinical trials where it kind of fits into the spectrum of where we need to go as well. Um, one of the questions I get, and I wanted to quickly just highlight, why doesn't ALS Canada or, or health charities like us invest more into clinical trials or expanded access programs? Um, in a very basic sense, uh, you know, Clinical trials are incredibly expensive. At ALS Canada, we're able to invest $1.5 to $2 million a year at the moment. Uh, I have spoken with a number of companies and have been told that this is not really enough to be able to do something substantial for a lot of what they would like to do. But I think from a different standpoint, we also have to understand that most clinical trials are funded by venture capital, large investments, people who have money to invest looking for return on investment. And, you know, that what we need to do is find ways to complement that. If these kinds of clinical trials are going to happen anyway, because you're going to have investors who want to look for good potential therapeutic targets, what we need to do is keep feeding the pipeline by understanding ALS better to get better targets, to get better clinical trials that people will want to fund uh, and ultimately push through clinical trial. Uh, and, and if we look at this from a certain standpoint of many of the more recently failed clinical trials, if ALS Canada or another organization had invested all of their money to just do a small portion of one of those clinical trials, all of that money would be gone and eventually we get to a point where we would ha not have good candidates for clinical trial anymore because we won't have enough people investing in understanding the disease effectively. In terms of expanded access programs in Canada, we call it special access, it's a little bit different. Uh, I think the key point here is that we need to find better ways to get industry to start to look at how they can expand the availability of trials while still being able to get to an answer, like I mentioned earlier. And, you know, noting that ALS is an urgent situation and we need to make sure as a, a community, we are doing everything we can to help people who have the disease now in an effective and, and proven manner, also through access to experimental therapeutics, but at the same time, uh, uh, doing rigorous work, which is time-tested for treatable diseases like cancers and cardiovascular diseases that require you to understand what's happening to get those targeted treatments to people. Uh, and in ALS Canada, a lot of this is, is well, all of our programs are not just decided by our staff or our board. They are recommended through a, a, a group called our Scientific and Medical Advisory Council, which includes individuals who are clinical and basic research or fundamental research. Some of them are not even heavily ALS invested, which provides a nice balance. We are also so excited to have members of the ALS community who are part of our Scientific and Medical Advisory Council moving forward. And we continually want to make sure we're having the most impact with the dollars to get people treatments as quickly as possible that are viable. Very quickly here, Looking at that uh, to provide a little bit of hope, hopefully here, um, you know, SOD1 was discovered as the first genetic cause of ALS in 1993. Um, it was in 2006 that Richard Smith, Tim Miller, Frank Bennett, 
Don Cleveland funded through the ALS Association in a very high risk, high reward sort of situation, funded the idea of antisense oligonucleotides as a potential therapy. And here we are about 15 years later getting our first results from uh, the Tofersen clinical trial later this year, which we hope will end up uh, working out. But a lot of the funding that happened at the fundamental research level allowed for the understanding that SOD1 was a toxic gain of function when it had mutations that could be knocked down that would lead ultimately to Tofersen. And why I say that is that when we look at where we are now, it wasn't until about 2006 that we got the first tools in the laboratory to start to have an understanding of where we are in terms of the wider cases of ALS. And now we're looking at the first sets of clinical trials like ataxin 2 and others that are really focused on ALS understandings of the past several years. And if we look at when the first ASO trial came for SOD1, it was 16 years after the discovery of that gene. And we're now talking about 15, 16 years uh, that we're starting to get clinical trials from the real understanding of what's happening at the disease. Um, and so I can expect that a lot of the fundamental research that we're funding now and over the past five to seven years are going to be critical investments that had to be made in part of that complementary mechanism. Just very quickly, I've only got a couple of slides left. I know I'm out of time. Uh, we can do Q&A after. Um, you know, if we look at the progression of therapies in ALS for clinical trials, it really started with very generic treatments for a long time while science was very rudimentary. And Lou Gehrig was part of a vitamin E clinical trial, in fact. Um, and these were all basically focused on maybe things that might be neuroprotective when we didn't have a lot of evidence. Once we started to be able to work in the lab more effectively on ALS after the discovery of the SD1 mutation, we started to get what I would call educated generic treatments. Things that you'll see are, are tested against a lot of neurodegenerative diseases not just ALS, but are focused more on targets that we've learned through laboratory models may be actually happening in the disease processes. And that's where we firmly rooted are today, a lot of educated generic treatments, things that are focused on maybe an anti-inflammatory mechanism that hasn't got a ton of proof in the lab just yet, but it is potentially going to work because we know that uh, inflammatory mechanisms are, are, are a part of ALS. And now in the last few years, we're starting to get to those first ALS targeted treatments and what we really need to do is get to those ones, and I've highlighted a couple here that have momentum at the preclinical level, like Stathman 2, that are really focused on ALS-specific mechanisms and might be our pathway ultimately to personalized treatment regimens, which is where we want to be. A really kind of weird way of looking at this, um, and hopefully this will resonate, I don't have a lot of time, I'd hope to have a little more time to explain it, is that when you have dysfunction in your motor neurons, it's like having a city with all kinds of crime in it. Um, not the best analogy, but in the end, something may have started that. There may be an organized crime that's happening, and the very first trigger of that is the kingpin or the, the, the crime boss at the start. And they will have a series of mechanisms just downstream that all have dysfunctions that happen as a result of those problems. And these are all the different things that are happening leading to uh, um, the problems happening within that particular city. Now, for SOD1, what we did for a lot of years was we just targeted something that we knew was dysfunctional, probably well downstream of SOD1, because we didn't have the technology to focus on SOD1 itself. We just wanted to find out what the very first dysfunction was downstream of the mutation in the SOD1 protein. And so when we stopped some of those, we didn't see a lot of clinical effect because as you can imagine downstream, you're not really having that same effect. There's a lot of other dysfunctional mechanisms happening in your motor neurons. Now, once we're able to take something like an ASO and target SOD1 directly, that's when you're actually able to stop all of those downstream mechanisms and potentially have a better effect on, on motor neuron health. So what we need to do is figure out through really rigorous work and experimentation, what are those mechanisms that are equivalent to the SOD1? Should it continue to work with Tophers and should it pan out? that are the same for the majority of people living with the disease. And we have come a long way in terms of understanding these upper level things that if we can normalize neuroinflammation or RNA biology, we probably have a good chance to have a significant impact. But what are those key, key things that we can target with therapies that are ultimately going to funnel down and have a large effect? And what I can say is most of the therapies we have today are really focused at this level down here. Uh, and so we need to get to that. And just to say that ALS is incredibly complex again. Um, and so getting to that understanding does take fuel. And just as a, another analogy to show you just how much 
difference there is in terms of treatable disease funding versus ALS. And I know we've all heard it. I'm just going to try a different way of looking at it today. If we take the Ice Bucket Challenge, which is an amazing thing that happened, and we took all of the funds that were globally raised and, and put them into a series of $1 million studies in the lab, a five, good five-year laboratory study, uh, and compared it to even just the 2005 investment in cancer worldwide, you're talking about 250 studies from the whole Ice Bucket Challenge versus 14,000 studies in one year, many years ago for cancer. The equivalent means that in that year, we would have to have 56 Ice Bucket Challenges just to meet the same investment level. And today, probably three or 400 times with the investment of being close to $100 billion a year. I didn't have an exact stat, so I used that one from a publication for 2005. But that's incredible to think about having to have 56 or 100 or 200 Ice Bucket Challenges challenges just to match the level of research that needs to be done to get to where we are in those other diseases that have personalized treatment regimens. And so this is why I often say that ALS scientists need to be like Iron Man, they need to be able to solve time travel or the biggest mysteries in science, but be able to produce remarkable results, results with very limited resources, and they are. And I think we can take solace in the fact that people are working really hard and coming to some great results in our understanding of the disease. We are going to get to more targeted therapies. Um, and, and, and in the meantime, we have more investment than ever in things that even if they are generically uh, intelligent and a little bit generic, they may work and in combination they may work better and we can get to things uh, in a much quicker way to leading to those ones that are, are, are going to have a significant, significant impact on stopping or uh, slowing or stopping the disease. So I am three minutes over time. I apologize for everyone. Uh, this is what happens when I get talking, um, but I'm going to say let's start the discussion. Um, uh, please do note that this will be recorded. So if you have, if you want to see the questions afterwards, they will be available. Otherwise, again, uh, let's talk offline about any of these things. I didn't get to have most of the things I would love to talk about, uh, but I'm sure it was enough for most of you, and hopefully of some benefit. So I'll stop talking, and uh, I will check my colleague, who is going to put in the chat if there are any questions. Okay. So uh, first question, how does a person with ALS volunteer to be part of a, uh, 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 to be a participant in a clinical trial? This is a fantastic question. Um, so the very first step is essentially where are you located uh, and who is your clinician? So if you have, uh, let's say you're in Canada and you're located uh, near Toronto. If your clinician is in Hamilton or Toronto, the first step is can you ask your clinician uh, whether or not they have any trials that you might be eligible for. That's the first step. At the same time, you can look online at the ALS signal database at clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, you can have a discussion with someone about what are the clinical trial options that are out there for you. You can look at what criteria you might be able to be involved in and what you might be interested in participating in and then contacting those particular trials to see if it's something that you're, you're eligible for. Uh, those are questions that can be really helped if we, we knew the specific details of where someone lived and, and what their particular uh, experience is and how Happy to have those discussions offline, um, but uh, the first step is really looking at what you're interested in, reaching out and suggesting if it's recruiting still, um, uh, and going through your clinician should they have uh, options. Um, and again, if you want more details on, on that, happy to talk offline in more detail. Okay, so we also have a question, was the biomarker system being applied re uh, retroactively to the older trial drugs? For instance, in 2012, the ceftriaxone trial wasn't even sure if it was getting through the blood-brain barrier and actually doing anything. There were many trials at the time, but I get the sense that they could have been less effective, uh, yes, or simply because of the delivery failure instead of the treatment failure. It's a great question, and so I think there's a lot of, of people in the field who say, you know, some of the trials we may have run in the past, if we'd had effective biomarkers, we might have been able to detect whether there was some benefit for certain people. And maybe we weren't far enough along in how to interpret trials at the time to see if something was working or not. Some of them probably very clearly weren't working. A lot of them obviously were not focused on mechanisms that we may say have a lot of evidence for ALS, but it's true that there's a possibility. And I think what people are going back is investigating some of that. Uh, the PROACT database is a good way to go back and be able to mine what was done before. Uh, this is an open database that industry can apply to or can 
uh, give their data to after they're done using it so people can use it for various aspects of, of understanding trials and looking back at old data. Uh, a really exciting one is what I sort of mentioned about UNC13A with lithium chloride in Europe. There's a gentleman, um, there's a group of gentlemen in uh, in the Netherlands, uh, Leonard Vandenberg, Michael Van Es, Ruben Van Eck, who are looking, uh, I think Michael Van Es is sort of leading this, uh, at genetic responders that may have occurred in certain clinical trials. So what he did is looked at all of the results from the lithium chloride trials that all failed for ALS, at least most of them failed in the more definitive trials. There was early trials that led to the, that seemed promising and led to the later trials. Um, and so what he's done is tried to collect as much of the collected material from those different trials and do a whole genome sequence on those individuals. And then look for, is there anything in those genome sequences for the people that appeared to have some response that may confer them to be particular responders to lithium chloride? And what they found, and this is a published study that you can look up, where there were certain people who had a, a uh, um, what's called a polymorphism in something called UNC13A, uh, which is going to probably be even more prominent after this year. Uh, there's some publications that show it, it may have some interesting aspects as a potential therapeutic target and biomarker itself. But the individuals with that change in UNC13A actually were responders, it seemed like, in the lithium chloride clinical trials. So now they're going back and seeing, can they recruit people with those specific genetic uh, uh, abnormality or that genetic change? into a clinical trial to see if lithium chloride might be a therapy specific for them. This is how we get to those kinds of personalized medicines. And uh, again, it's advancing uh, not fast enough for ALS, but certainly with what we have, a lot of thought being put into going back and trying to get a good understanding of, of, of how we can uh, uh, maybe relook at things um, and uh, and see who might benefit from, from various things. At the same time, moving forward, because we do need to get more intelligent therapies that are focused on a, a lot of our better understanding of the disease. Uh, and happy to talk about that as well offline in a more detailed way as well. Uh, there's also a question, Is there are there clinical trials for KD, for Kennedy's disease? Uh, that's a great question. There, I believe there are some clinical trials for Kennedy's disease, also known as spinal bus bulbar muscular atrophy. They're not as wide as ALS clinical trials, um, largely because it's a, a bit more rare. I would highly uh, urge you to go to clinicaltrials.gov and see what might be recruiting. I'm not sure if there are any in Canada, although there is an expert in Canada, or at least a, an individual who who is a, uh, a prominent ALS neurologist who also sees a lot of individuals who have Kennedy's disease in Saskatchewan, Dr. Carrie Schellenberg. Uh, so it may not hurt to, to look into whether or not she has any uh, um, evidence as to um, what might be emerging in terms of clinical trials for Kennedy's disease. But I think uh, the best thing would be to search uh, clinicaltrials.gov to see if there's there's anything ongoing. There's certainly a good, robust Kennedy's disease um, uh, preclinical and clinical uh, uh, field and community that are working really hard on that. And uh, um, uh, I just, I don't have the answer right now and I apologize. I could look it up for you if, if that's helpful and you can contact me offline. Um, okay, so I think that seems to be all the questions we have. If there are any other questions that someone has, is again, uh, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, you can send us an email and uh, certainly connect with us either through DM or through my open chats would be really great because uh, some people may have the same questions as you. Um, I'm hopeful that this was beneficial and uh, always welcome feedback on that because uh, we, we certainly really care about you and not really the medium or the the message that's going out except i mean from our end so um we want you to be able to get what you're looking for out of these things so um oh and now i have another question <laughs> um why does sod1 only seem to affect the voluntary muscle system since you must assume it goes uh throughout the entire body yeah so that's a great question. So why are, I guess the question is, why are motor neurons preferentially susceptible in ALS? Um, and so SOD1 is a great example of a protein that is what we call ubiquitous. It has function in all the different cells of our body. So what makes motor neurons more susceptible? It's a long age old question and there are a lot of things that we know about motor neurons might make them susceptible compared to other neurons. 
Um, they're large. They take up a large amount of energy to 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 do their function. They have specific mechanisms within them, uh, specific type of firing that they need to do. Um, uh, they are connected to different cell types like neuromuscular junctions with the lower motor neurons. Um, all these things can influence motor neurons versus any other cell type of the body um, and may influence why SOD1 or other things, other mutate mutant proteins or even uh, a group of proteins that aren't a specific muta mutated form may lead to the preferential vulnerability of these motor neurons. Um, another, another very big one is that neurons in general are very different from other cell types. They're what we call post-mitotic, which means that they don't divide. Uh, you know, you get a neuron and you have that neuron for the most part throughout the bot for, throughout your lifetime, and this can change the biology of a cell quite substantially. And uh, and and it also means it's not able to deal with uh, problems within it as easily because you can't just simply divide and 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 you know dilute down a problem. You're stuck with it, and you need to figure out as a neuron how to how to deal with that problem. Um, so. Uh, it's an age-old question. We don't have a great understanding, but we certainly are able to study motor neurons more effectively now, specifically um, different ways that we can look at motor neurons, specifically in the laboratory. Um, and we're evolving our ability to take them actually from people living with ALS, turn these through stem cells, through what we call iPS-derived cells, into or um, uh, induced motor neurons uh, to be able to study human motor neurons in the laboratory and get better answers to those kinds of questions. Um, but still, still a ways to go um, as to why they are preferentially uh, vulnerable. Okay, uh, someone else asked, how do I find out if I have any genetic abnormalities in the known genes uh, 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 for ALS? Again, unfortunately, this one depends on where you live. The number one thing you should be doing is asking your clinician about this. Um, there are a number of strategies going around to try to have a wider acceptance of uh, uh, genetic testing um, for panels of genes at least, because what we do know is that there are a number of people who are classically considered as sporadic ALS who will have mutations in known ALS genes, including SOD1, uh, and a significant number of people who don't have a family history who will have uh, uh, mutations in C9 or 72. And I think that that one is really driving the acceptance around the field to, to start to uh, look at a wider set of genetic screening. Those strategies are, are, are evolving to try to get a, a wider acceptance on this. A lot of it has to do with uh, um, uh, clinics being able to order them to get uh, it paid for. And a large part of it has to do with uh, availability of genetic counseling, because it's not a simple answer for people. Uh, you know, certainly if you have an SOD1 mutation, maybe it's a little simpler in certain ways, still not simple, and, and but, but at the same time, uh, complex ones, uh, other genetic causes of the disease that we know about are, are can be quite complex. Um, and particularly ones that don't have treatment options yet that are specifically designed against them. Um, we have a ways to go, but I think the number one thing you can do is ask to your clinician. If you don't get viable answers from that, you can talk to us about what, you know, who you can connect with. We can facilitate connecting you to other people who know more about the landscape in Canada, the landscape in the US and the landscape globally um, to help sort of at least have you feel comfortable um, with uh, how you wanna move forward or the potential options you have to move forward on on looking into genetic testing. Um, but it's an evolving piece in the ALS field and, uh, and obviously gene targeted therapies like the ones I spoke about are driving that because once we start to have things that are really working, it's important to make sure we don't leave people behind who may benefit from these potential therapies. Uh, in all the clinical trials, do some focus on reversing the symptoms versus just slowing down the progression? So that is the ultimate thing we would love to have. Um, and I don't think anything sets out at, with the idea of saying, all I would like to do is slow down the progression of the disease. The idea of reversal is a difficult one. So, you know, essentially what happens is your motor neurons are formed when you're very, very small. I think it's the size of a bean or a, a peanut and they grow with you. They connect to your, your, your muscles, they connect to your brain, your brain and your muscles connected, and they grow with you throughout time. And you have one set of these motor neurons. 
And the, the idea of being able to regenerate these in an environment that is not working very well in terms of the cells that are surrounding it are not perfectly functional, getting them to connect back with the specific muscle cells that they were originally connected with and having that firing work effectively is a very daunting idea. It doesn't mean it's not possible. It doesn't mean that there aren't people who are focusing on ways that we can actually uh, reinstate motor neurons uh, to be able to reconnect muscles. It just means that it's it's something we don't talk about a lot because the first step is how can we say after diagnosis when there's dysfunction happening in people's motor neurons, can we at least start to look towards stopping that progress? How can we get in there and slow it down a, a whole lot or at least go in and stop it? And then think about maybe preventing it someday where we can detect someone upstream and maybe stop or slow down the process before they get clinical symptoms providing a better quality of life, but certainly the idea is always there about potentially reversing. It's just a very difficult concept to, to think about. I will also say that there's a, there is some research that's done uh, if you look into individuals who are working at the neuromuscular junction, um, that does seem to show, particularly uh, a gentleman here in Canada, Richard Robitaille, has shown that for a period of time, you do have a pulling away from the, the, the muscle of the lower motor neuron. And then most motor neurons will make an attempt to try to re-engage with that muscle cell and to get back connected again. But some of the functions that are in healthy motor neurons or in that healthy neuromuscular junction that are required for that to happen uh, are dysfunctional. So there's also a hope that perhaps if you catch something early enough, perhaps you can uh, um, augment some of those mechanisms and, and reconnect and, and possibly have the idea of reversal of symptoms. But I think from an overall sense of what you're asking, um, this would be fantastic if we could do this. And, and so please don't take it when someone says slowing progression as a, as a uh, half-assed attempt at trying to help people. It's, it's more from a, a standpoint of we need to better understand what's happening and we need to go in and start plugging holes in the dam. Uh, or in the case of SOD1, perhaps just, you know, building a new dam over top of it. So there's zero plug, zero holes to plug. Um, but, but, looking at reversal would be certainly wonderful if we if we could uh, figure out how to do that. Um, so yeah, I hope that helped. Um, and again, happy to talk about it in more detail offline. Um, and uh, so I think that is all the questions that I see for now. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Uh, again, please provide feedback if you have it, um, because um, you know, we'll only continue to do these if they're valuable and uh, and hope to run into some of you offline. Uh, so wishing everyone a wonderful rest of the day and thanks so much.